Good afternoon or good morning or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Thank you for joining us here today. It is wonderful to have you with us and thank you for being with us for this book launch and online discussion. A warm welcome from Nuremberg on behalf of the International Academy. My name is Vivian Dietrich and it is a true pleasure to be moderating the event today. Thank you. You will recognize my virtual background as courtroom 600, the very courtroom where the Nuremberg trials were held from 1945 to 1946. The International Criminal Court, established as a permanent international criminal court, has developed into an enduring fixture in international criminal law. Now, the 20th anniversary this year of the entry into force of the Rome Statute allows us anew a timely opportunity to engage and re-engage the debates on the court's development, practice and effectiveness. Accordingly, the book being launched today and our discussion today recognizes and contributes to a continuous task, revisiting the past, examining the present and imagining the future. In the next 105 minutes, we will first present the new book and then engage in a panel discussion on select key topics. There will be an opportunity to ask questions and the panelists look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, first of all, to the Nuremberg Academy team supporting the event today, especially Bertold and Evelyn behind the scenes, as well as Maria Alejandra, who's also handling the Q&A today. The event is being recorded. Today, I am joined by six distinguished experts. We are delighted you immediately accepted our invitation and are joining us today. And I would like to most warmly welcome um, the president, Judge Pieter Rofmanski, as president of the International Criminal Court. It is so wonderful that you are able to join the discussion today. Also, Dr. Christoph Eich, the director general and legal advisor of the German Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Good to have you with us, thank you. Professor Leila Sadat, James Carr Professor of International Criminal Law at Washington University of St. Louis and the Special Advisor on Crimes Against Humanity to the ICC Prosecutor. Professor Charles Jallo, Professor of Law at Florida International University and a member of the United Nations International Law Commission. Melinda Reed is acting convener of the Coalition for the International Criminal Court and the executive director of the Women's Initiatives for Gender Justice. And Dr. Alexander Heinzer as assistant professor of law at the University of Göttingen and co-editor of the book being launched today. Thank you for being with us very much. And to those who are joining us from near and far, I really warmly welcome you. We have national and international experts, as well as judges, prosecutors, representatives for international organizations, governments, civil society, as well as numerous scholars and students watching today. I understand we had around 450 registrations and we are grateful for the interest that the event has garnered. The book we are launching today, The Past, Present and Future of the International Criminal Court is available as an open access publication, as well as a hardcover book. At the Academy, we have a firm commitment to open access publications. And a series editor, I am pleased that the book is published in the Nuremberg Academy series. If you are curious about other volumes in the series, I invite you to discover these um, as open access versions on the Academy's website. Previous volumes deal with various topics from the deterrent effect of international tribunals to Islam and international criminal law, to the Tokyo Tribunal, to integrity in international justice. The book, The Past, Present and Future of the International Criminal Court makes a timely contribution to the extensive literature on the ICC by bringing together both scholars and practitioners. In line with the chosen title, the assembled authors here portray the establishment of the court and the early days in terms of practice, hence the theme past, critically engage with achievements and challenges and its organs, the track record to date, hence the theme present, and they draw conclusions and sketch possible contours, suggestions and scenarios for the way forward, hence the theme future. The volume includes contributions from insiders, that is officials and staff of the court, reflecting on their own institution, as well as external experts who lend their scholarly voices to a better understanding and analysis of the court. 
We feel extremely honored um, that the anthology is graced by a foreword by the president of the International Criminal Court, Piotr Rofmanski, and a foreword by the chair of the board of directors of the Trust Fund for Victims, Mama Koite Dombuya. It was important to us for the book to indeed place a special emphasis on the important role of victims. Here, a brief glimpse into the structure and focus of the book. It contains 26 chapters overall, as is divided into three parts. Part one on stock taking traces the origins of international criminal law from the International Military Tribunal in Nuremberg to the establishment of the ICC. Methodologically, it combines historical accounts as well as prescriptive analyses. Part two on context and constraints is the normative heart of the book. Um, we have five sections which deal with prosecutorial policy and practice, jurisdiction and admissibility, victims and witnesses, defense issues, and legitimacy and effectiveness. Now, part three on achievements and legacies is reserved for personal accounts and broader perspectives on the question for Vardis ICC. The book includes indeed a number of papers and speeches given at the Nuremberg Forum 2018, which was um, dedicated to the topic, the 20th anniversary of the Rome Statute. The conference included engaging keynote speeches from the German Federal Foreign Minister Heiko Maas and the then ICC prosecutor Fatou Ben Souda, as well as an inspiring closing speech by Judge Bertram Schmidt, all of which feature in the book. At the outset, I would like to acknowledge the contributions and support of many experts and colleagues. The book certainly is a collective effort. And I'd like to particularly thank Klaus Rackfitz for the support lent to the project, and especially Yolana Makrayova and Maria Alejandra Moreno Mantilla for their valuable assistance. A big thank you, of course, also to Torkel Opsal Academic e Publisher for providing a publishing platform for this volume in the Nuremberg Academy series. Especially thank you to Martin Bergsmore for his support and to Antonio Angotti for his dedicated editorial assistance. Special thank you to all contributors, among them leading practitioners and scholars who have written wonderful, wonderful chapters. I'm delighted that many authors are with us here for the book launch today. Special thanks, um, I'd like to say, to Benjamin Ferenc, who penned the first chapter opening part one of the book, urging, urging the readers to ponder whether power or reason is the way to peace. Ben has been a friend, a good friend of the Academy for um, many, many years, and the Nuremberg Academy organized a special event on the occasion of his 101st birthday in March 2021, um, with a special appearance by Ben himself, which was certainly a highlight, and the recording of the event is available online. Special thanks also to my co-editor, um, Alex, it has been a pleasure working with you on this exciting book project. I'm glad you are joining us to present the book further. So immediately, without further ado, over to you. Well, thank you, dear Viviane. The panel discussion is just a few minutes away. And since it directly reflects the topic in the book, please let me give a short teaser um, of the book. So in a way, book editing is reminiscent of conducting an orchestra. You cannot get too involved in this soloist interpretation of the piece, but at the same time, you need to make sure the piece transports the idea of the composer. So the idea of this book was to show that the past, present and future of the ICC are connected. And there was a more subtle idea though, but it soon became clear to us that this subtle idea was no less important um, than the main one. And this idea was to be conscious of the nature of the book as an academic endeavor and to make sure that this endeavor meets high standards. So in a way, the book is also about the role of scholarship in international criminal law by being in itself a contribution to scholarship. We believe that the relationship of scholarship and international criminal practice will be one of the main orchestra pieces to work on in the future. And that is also the reason why this topic is part of the entering panel discussion, if we have time, which we hopefully have. We are grateful to see that the connection of the past, present and future of the ICC has been made visible in the book the way we hoped. This is due to a group of authors from different backgrounds, disciplines and nationalities, especially diversity in disciplines is an underrated topic. Robinson in a recent publication observes a suppressed lawyer perspective in international criminal law, while in our book, Ben Ferenc seems to make lawyers responsible for setting up hurdles 
in the prosecution for the crime of aggression. In the book, it is Judge Shovmansky in his foreword who gives the element of the past of the ICC the importance it deserves by saying, understanding the essence of international criminal justice and the need for a permanent international criminal court is best achieved from a historical perspective. For an overview, I recommend the section in Laila Sarat's chapter, and of course, the chapter in the on the Nuremberg Principles by Katarina Smigova. It is easy to identify challenges for the ICC at present. The book puts the emphasis on complementarity, jurisdiction, and admissibility, which is section C, uh, B, and victims and witnesses, which is section C. With positive complementarity, there's a recurring aspect in the book, especially in the chapters of Andrea Marone, Adigi Adekunle, and Laila Sarat. And this could not be more topical after at the end of last year, the prosecutor announced the closure of the preliminary examination of the situation in Colombia. The section on victims and witnesses is, I would say, and Viviane certainly too, the heart of the book and the reason why we are most grateful to Mama Dumbuya, former chair of the board of directors of the Trust Fund for Victims, to write a second forward. The section is also worth mentioning for its diversity and methods. Victim and witness protection is addressed empirically and psychologically by Ellie Smith and more normatively and sociologically by Juan Pablo Perez Leon Quevedo. Christoph Safferling and Gurgen Petrosian apply a categorical analysis to victim participation, and the chapter on witness evidence law by Hilde Fadhofer is a masterpiece in systematization, I would say. We as editors try to resist the temptation to select topics according to their occurrence on the list of flaws the ICC allegedly has. But of course, these topics had to be addressed in one way or another. After all, almost half of the authors analyzed the results of the independent expert review report. As a compromise, we focused less, and this was very hard, less on prosecutorial discretion, even though Fanny Lafontaine's and Claire Manu's analysis of the concept most responsible and Cara Cunningham Warren's chapter on head of state aggression prosecutions are illuminating, but we focus more on institutional matters and legitimacy. Institutionally, Kip Hale shares recommendations to build a culture of professional development of all professional staff at the ICC and for a long-term budget resolution. Philip Curran and Bryce van Erbs fill a gap in research on the organization of the defense before the ICC and Benjamin Gumpert and Julia Nussbank scrutinize institutional strategic and normative features of the court organs and statute that affect duration of the proceedings, which is obviously a very important issue. Legitimacy as an old companion of international criminal justice debates has been given new clothes by von Maltitz and Körner and Shannon Five. As institutional integrity, Shannon Five employs her philosophical expertise to consider the legitimacy of the ICC in light of three recent decisions of the court, von Maltitz and Körner, with analytical brilliance, I must say, use legitimacy as a fresh perspective to define the concept and term situation. The panel discussion, in just a few minutes, will mainly revolve around the future of the ICC, obviously. This part of the book has almost written in itself. Uh, the questions that authors addressed are in part summarized by Judge Mansky in his foreword. With the court's workload continually growing, will states provided with sufficient resources and the high level of cooperation required for the effective discharge of its mandate? Will national jurisdictions step up to the plate in accordance with the principle of complementarity to prevent the ICC from being overburdened? We will continue to ask these questions in the panel discussion. Many authors in the book make the laudable effort to combine a critical analysis with constructive engagement. Fergal Gaynor's analytical piece on possible future referrals by the UN General Assembly is very persuasive. And the empirical study of private investigations by Andre Vadikva Jonathan and Nicolas Ortiz gives an insight into the work of the Commission for International Justice and Accountability seizure that is unparalleled so far. The book finishes as it started with the broader picture of the ICC's anniversary within an era of mindset shift towards anti-multilateralism. Judge Smith encourages an open engagement with the court's achievements and challenges. Barbara Lochbieler and Heiko Maas draw the attention to the alliance of multilateralism. All this in a time when, as Kip Hale puts it in his chapter, Geopolitically, the ICC has become a pop popular punching bag. 
It goes without saying that the position of the USA, Russia, by Judge Tush Makamedov, and the African states receive particular attention in the book. Given the current geopolitical situation, Ben Ferenc's statement seemed to have aged very well. Every war that is not in self-defense or authorized by the mandate of the Security Council is a crime against humanity and should be condemned as such. I finish, international criminal justice is a collective endeavor and collective endeavors also like this book are not so much defined by speaking, but more by listening. And if I'm allowed to disclose this, Judge Hovmanski, I learned this as a young visiting professional at the ICC's appeals chamber, when the then newly elected, uh, elected Judge Hovmanski asked every morning how I was and why no one except himself and me wore a bike helmet in the Netherlands. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you ever so much for this quick tour de force of what the book um, has to offer. The book certainly adds to ongoing conversations about the court's trajectory. And in the course of this anniversary year, um, we will have multiple opportunities for scholars and practitioners to take the time for introspection and critical reflection. Looking ahead to October, allow me to just mention that the Nuremberg Academy is organizing its major annual conference, the Nuremberg Forum, precisely on the topic of the past 20 years of the ICC, looking at a court in practice. In our panel discussion today, we will touch upon three main topics, the International Criminal Court today, and state engagement and disengagement, its place in the wider institutional landscape and the interplay of national and international proceedings, as well as the court's future development impact and outlook. Now, I would like to invite our panelists to join me for a panel discussion. And once again, I very, very warmly welcome President Osmanski, Dr. Christoph Eich, Professor Leila Sadat, Professor Charles Jallo, Melinda Reed, and Alexander Heinze, and we'll join the discussion again later on. We have a terrific lineup of distinguished panelists today who will provide a myriad of perspectives and expert views. I certainly look forward to a rich discussion. The first theme that we will be exploring today is the ICC Today Contributions, Cooperation and Contestation. As we kick off our discussion, it is timely to reflect on the court's institutional development, practice and effectiveness. And in his foreword to our book, President Ofmansky, you perceptively reflect on the 20th anniversary of the court. I quote, one might say that 20 years is long enough to solidify and secure a place in the history of international criminal law. At the same time, however, 20 years is a too short a period to formulate universal and conclusive assessments. Accordingly, those who refer to the court as an ambitious but still fresh project are right, end quote. So let me first turn to you, President of Mansky. We are truly grateful that you agreed to write the foreword and are with us here today. Allow me to ask you directly, what do you see as the most important institutional achievement or contribution and ongoing challenge of the ICC right now? Do you at all see an effectiveness deficit these days? President of Mansky. Thank you very much, uh, Madam uh, Dr. Dietrich, uh, dear colleagues. Um, let me let me uh, start by saying the ICC is in a good path. It, it is in, in just twenty years the court has mm, crossed a long road from from modest beginning to a very dynamic international court that stands firmly on its feet. The ICC is today busier than ever. Uh, delivering justice, doing the job uh, as, as envisaged by, by, by its creators, including preparations, uh, which are in, in full swing. There are, in my opinion, three uh, most important challenges today. The first one is how to cope with ever-growing workload with limited resources. This year, with five simultaneous trials, we have achieved a limit of our capacity. Uh, 
There are no more courtrooms, no more judges, no more staff to, to, to broaden the scope of our judicial operations. And the same concerns the, the prosec prosecutorial activity with, with 16 situations that the Office of the Prosecutor has achieved the record number. And, and there is no clear answer how to rack the situation, how to manage the future challenges. This is something that the whole international community needs to think about and I I would it would send a very bad message if if we have to start telling victims and others sorry we are aware of the report of the atrocities but the court is already full and we cannot we can do anything about it it would be something horrible for for, for all of us and the second challenge the second challenge is is of political nature it is true that, that the, the court can never make everybody happy with, with, with its judgments and, and decision. That does, does not mean that, that it can be politically attacked because of its judgments, decisions, policies, and choices. And in this context, I, I, I would like to say that, that the great achievement of the court was to resist the unprecedented attacks uh, of the court by the Trump administration with the solid support of the state parties to, to the Rome statute. At the same time, however, I believe that such attacks may pose serious challenges in the future. And therefore, it's absolutely necessary to develop some coherent strategy to counter the challenges. But it's, of course, more, more for, for state parties than for, for the court itself. And the third challenge is linked to the poor cooperation of the part of states. It is not only about not executed arrest warrants, but also about the enforcement of sentences and the protection of witnesses. The number of voluntary agreements with state parties is limited in relation to, to the needs. And to try to answer the, the last part of, of the question, I, I do not seem to share the thesis about the crisis of the court efficiency. Of course, there's always room for improvement. I believe that the court has been doing a lot lately to increase this efficiency, which is absolutely necessary in view of the growing workload. Currently, the court is implementing recommendations of the report of independent experts in which inter alia uh, attention is paid to the need for efforts in this um, direction. So far, uh, on this question. Thank you very much, President Lofmansky, for sketching multiple avenues, and I'm sure we'll have the opportunity to delve into deeper. Thank you so much for sharing um, your views and the three challenges, which we will also delve into more depth in the course of the discussion. Thank you. Um, Leila, allow me to, to bring you in here. Um, thanks again for your wonderful chapter um, to the book. It was fantastic to, to read it, and I know at the end of that, you already get into some of the challenges that you identify. Um, and one in particular um, stands out, that of universality. I know in the interest of time, perhaps we also fold this back into um, this um, question. So same question to you. What do you see as the most important institutional achievements and ongoing challenges of the ICC right now? Thank you so much, Vivian. And uh, thank you also, Alexander. This has been a wonderful tour de force uh, to read this book. I haven't completely digested it. Judge Hofmansky, thank you, uh, President, for your remarks as well. What I'm going to do is just speak very, very briefly about um, not so much what's what's in my chapter, but maybe what is in the interstices of my chapter and, and is evoked by some of the other uh, contributors to the volume. So I should add that I'm speaking here uh, not as a special advisor, but in my personal capacity as a longtime scholar of international criminal law, uh, including the ICC. And I did attend the Rome uh, Diplomatic negotiations. I was only a child at the time, of course, and, and I've seen the court develop uh, over many years. I think in terms of institutional achievements, one cannot forget, and this is part of the looking back, that even having that diplomatic conference and that vote on July 17th, uh, 1998, was an extraordinary achievement. And I think the miracle of the court's birth is something that we need to evoke as we struggle with the ongoing challenges to the court 
uh, at the present time. The entry into force of the ICC statute, um, decades in some ways, be, uh, before we thought that would happen, is another extraordinary achievement. As we recall, 60 states had to ratify the statute in order for the entry into force to take place. And uh, many have attributed that, that quick entry into force to the opposition of a prior US president, George uh, w. Bush, who um, attacked the court uh, in a different way than the, the last president of the United States. And uh, I think states rallied to, to the idea that justice mattered. And so the fact that the statute came into force to, four years later was extraordinary. Then we had the first elections, which I remember following from my desk in St. Louis, Missouri, and uh, the fact that women were actually going to be members of this court in a much more significant number than we had seen at other international courts and tribunals, and that justice thereafter would have a permanent seat at the table, that the prosecutor of the ICC would speak to the United Nations Security Council every year, even if it is only in frustration. Nonetheless, the fact that justice is a permanent part of the global equation is an extraordinary achievement. I remember hearing Navi Pillay talking about how important it is to have a presence for human rights when the Security Council meets, when other United Nations organs are debating important issues. And the fact that there is now a permanent institution in permanent present premises, which was also not a foregone conclusion, that has a seat at the table is really extraordinary. Now, in terms of challenges, the book highlights so many any of them. I'll just, in the interest of time, uh, maybe point readers to the extraordinary title that Dr. Alexander Heinz has for his chapter, Attacked, Applauded, Threatened, and Universalized, or Just Another Wednesday at the International Criminal Court, which is really, I think, very evocative. Um, there are politics that are swirling around the court, and that's not just with respect to the court. It's with respect to all international institutions. And so the atmosphere we have right now, if the 1990s were the age of the accountability, some have called our current decade the age of the strong man. So that the politics that are affecting the court are not specific only to the court. We're seeing some dysfunction at the UN Security Council, to put it mildly. We're seeing uh, the emergence of conflict, again, not just intrastate, but interstate potentially. And we're seeing a rise in atrocity situations around the world. So the ICC could not be more important and yet could not face uh, a more challenging global environment. The processes inside the court are also something that I think we'll speak more about. So I'll leave that to, um, to others. But obviously, there's been much focus on can we professionalize and deepen the institutional structures of the court, not so much so they can respond to external political pressure, but so we can simply become a more grown up, maybe we're a toddler now or a young adolescent, uh, and, and we can weather uh, difficulties. I think uh, the chapter on the defense is very important important. That was a neglected part of the Rome Statute, not having clear rules for the defense, a clear professional standard for the International Criminal uh, Justice Bar was uh, probably a mistake at that time. And so that's something we're backfilling as we go. And finally, on the substance, I agree with so many of the chapters. I think Shannon Fife's point on the need for integrity uh, in uh, proceedings is very, very important on the need for a coherent uh, judicial uh, response to similarly situated uh, uh, cases, I think is something that came through the independent expert review. And I think that thanks to the leadership of Judge Havmansky and the other judges, I think that's being taken very seriously as well. So I think I'll stop there. I, I hope that the future is as bright as my background, but there's no doubt that we have some challenges. Uh, and I think we'll take up the university cha universality challenge perhaps uh, in a little bit. So thank you so much for allowing me to be part of this conversation. Leda, thanks ever so much. Wonderful. Thank you. And we will indeed get into some of these topics again in a short while. Allow me to, to bring in you, Melinda, um, and the important perspective of civil society. Perhaps you can speak directly um, to the perspective that you hold on precisely the most important institutional achievement and the most pressing challenges that you see at the court right now. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here, um, and thank you to the other panelists for your remarks uh, so far. 
in, in trying to formulate a response to this, I was trying to capture, as you indicated, uh, the perspective of civil society and the enormous uh, wealth of information in the book. Uh, and that was a challenge. Uh, so in speaking with some of our members and colleagues, uh, we decided to focus on um, a sort of a specific strength that we saw. Uh, but really what we came up with is that the most important achievement and ongoing challenges are sort of two sides of the same coin to us. Uh, we would highlight as a success prosecution and investigations, and as a, an ongoing challenge, a lack of resources, as has been indicated by other panelists. Uh, the achievement specifically that we would want to highlight is that the Office of the Prosecutor has been steadily moving to open investigations um, and that fall within the court's mandate. And as of now, we have 16 investigations in all regions of the world. And this was a really significant uh, achievement from our standpoint. Um, and if you look at them all together, it really symbolizes a real success in promoting equality before the law. I think as a, another specific example within that, uh, we've seen some really tremendous progress on the prosecution of sexual and gender-based crimes, including charges of forced pregnancy and persecution on the basis of gender. These are groundbreaking revolutionary moments um, and, and we did not want to uh, miss an opportunity to really highlight what we see as, as significant progress there. Uh, with the challenge, as, as indicated, I think the lack of resources to successfully pursue these investigations, um, it, it's a real factor. Um, we see the actual delivery of justice lagging behind the sort of forward movement, movement we've seen with investigations. So I think what we're looking at is an expansion of the norm but a real challenge in delivering on that norm. And that does impact the legitimacy of the ICC and the very idea of accountability. I think this sort of lagging behind has subject the court to some critique, including from states parties. And the court um, is often accused of being spread too thin um, and there have been calls for greater prioritization. Uh, I think what this critique overlooks is that the court has so many investigations, not because of mission creep, uh, but because there is um, a failure of the international community to deter uh, crimes under the Rome statute. And I think if, if we look at it from that perspective, it is less about, uh, you know, judges who authorize investigations going too far and, and more about the responsibility of the international community. I think you know if, if we could more robustly support national justice, that would allow the court to be more selective, to truly be a court of last resort, that would be the ideal. But in fact, I think the reality is that it's often the court of both first and last resort. Uh, so to answer the second part of the question, I think in essence, yes, there is an effectiveness deficit. I think there should have been greater progress at this point on some of the situations that have been open since the earliest days. I think there's a number of factors here uh, for why that hasn't happened. Some of it related to cooperation challenges, uh, but I do believe that some of it is stemming from a lack of vision as to what the court seeks to achieve as it opens new situations. I think this should be supplied from the beginning so that the court can close down its work on a given situation, pass on responsibility to national authorities and move what will always be finite resources to new situations as they arise. I think in the absence of that vision, it will not work to just shut down situations and move on. There needs to be a real grappling with these, um, these challenges with all stakeholders. So I think, you know, to, to sum up, I think there are some remarkable achievements. And I think the, the challenge now is to, to get the ability to deliver justice, to catch up with those incredible achievements in, in prosecutions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Melinda. And um, again, for that powerful plea to grapple with the challenges. And we will have an opportunity to speak more about um, the development, reform, independent expert review in a short while. Um, I'd like to pick up on one of the um, topics that has been mentioned numerous times now already um, by the first three expert speakers, um, the interplay of law and politics, state engagement and disengagement. And um, I would like to turn to, to Dr. Aik, who is well placed to speak about international cooperation. Your perspective is most valuable here. Allow me to ask you, how can international cooperation be strengthened in your view? How do you envisage the relationship of the court vis-a-vis -vis states parties in the next 20 years? 
Well, thank thank you very much, and and let me say that I'm I'm delighted to be here uh, on this on this panel, and congratulations uh, to the Academy for for the publication. Um, uh, and I, I I would like to um, to stress, as others before me have done, that state cooperation, of course, uh, is key, uh, and it starts with. Uh, you know, people may call you know little things, but uh, this is the daily work of of the court, which uh, which um, uh, sends out a cooperation requests uh, both the registry and and the prosecutor nearly on a daily basis. And it is uh, extremely important that uh, states respond to those requests uh, and and facilitate the work uh, the work of the court. Um, and then there are there are issues such as uh, such as funding. Uh, I think um, uh, President Hofmanski has also mentioned uh, the trust fund for victims. Uh, this is this is important. We also have a, a, a trust fund for family visits. Uh, many people don't know about it, but this is something that is also important uh, uh, for for states to um, uh, to contribute to contribute to so as to uh, to allow the court. Uh, and its institutions to 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 work. Uh, cooperation agreements um, uh, with the court uh, have also been been mentioned already, and I think that's uh, that's indeed an important thing. Uh, but perhaps the most importantly um, is uh, speaking up for the court. Uh, I, I think that that is something uh, that that is extremely important that state parties speak up for the court and if need be and we've had uh, uh, occasion to do so um, to protect the, the court from unfair um, attacks uh, I, I think this is extremely important now of course we, we've talked briefly already um, about uh, challenges and we are in in an extremely challenging uh, environment um, Today, as you know, the basic tenets of international law are being are being violated. Uh, it is really important to remind uh, ourselves of what the ICC stands for. It stands for um, the rule of law over uh, over injustice, um, uh, and and I, I think that that is something that is really. Uh, that merits uh, re reflection. Um, uh, we are in a challenging environment, uh, but uh, state parties uh, such as Germany, for, for 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 sure, are continuing to to work towards universalization. I think that's uh, that has been mentioned. Uh, you know, we have 123 state parties. We could have more. Um, uh, that that would be uh, would be a, a very welcome. Um, uh, development, and then the Security Council. The Security Council, living up to its responsibilities, referring situation, um, uh, and 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 allowing uh, and enforcing states uh, to uh, to cooperate uh, with uh, with the state organs uh, is something where many state parties um, are, are willing to, um, uh, to, to 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 you know to push. Uh, and and to add their weight uh, to um, to helping the court and helping us all um, to uh, fulfill the call for uh, for for justice. That's thank that's you. all. Thank you. Thank you very much. You you highlight the central importance of international law. Indeed, it's a foundation for effective multilateralism and strong international organizations, courts, and tribunals. It is paramount as a counterpoint to contested multilateralism um, and the alliance of multilateralism and alliance against impunity championed by Germany is particularly noteworthy, I find. Um, allow me a direct follow-up um, to you, Dr. Eich. What is the role of this alliance for multilateralism and alliance against impunity in terms of strengthening the court? How do you think can the alliances extend beyond the already engaged states and into the future? Well, uh, it, 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 this, this, this alliance for multilateralism, which um, you know, also um, uh, provides a, 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 a backdrop for uh, the alliance against impunity, uh, is is uh, is something that is that is um, you know uh, that has was created really because we need more multilateralism. We need more effort, uh, joint effort by uh, by states uh, and and others, uh, not only states, uh, but also uh, what is you know. Often called civil society um, uh, by 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 people around the world, organizations around the world, um, to um, uh, to to allow 
um, uh, to, to allow you know law and international law to prevail uh, over uh, over power politics. So um, re really, this this uh, th this uh, initiative, uh, these initiatives are um, uh, uh, are born out of the necessity uh, to uh, to have to find solutions. Uh, based on, um, on on international law, and we, we work in, in many in many areas. And I will just um, mention perhaps one, which is I know is dear uh, to to everybody's heart on the panel. I'm sure is is to um, uh, to find a way uh, to uh, to adopt a convention uh, for the prohibition prohibition and 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 punishment. Uh, of of crimes against humanity. I think this is something that um, that many of us uh, have been working for, where, where it's extremely difficult uh, to achieve progress, but where we are not uh, not giving up uh, to uh, fill this uh, la lacuna, so to speak, in in the international crimes, uh, to to have a framework, a convention uh, on, on that covers crimes uh, crimes against humanity. Thank you, Viviana. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Ike. Thank you and for mentioning that very important initiative and the draft convention. Um, absolutely. I hope we have some time to, to discuss that further in the in the Q&A later on. Um, Charles, allow me to, to bring you in here. Um, fantastic to see you. The Nuremberg Academy has been very pleased to partner with um, SILPA and the American Society of International Law for the ICC Colloquium Series. We just held the fourth roundtable discussion a few weeks back. Um, allow me to ask you also the same question. How can international cooperation be strengthened? How do you envisage the relationship of the court vis-a-vis -vis states parties or and non-vis-a-vis non-state parties in the next 20 years? And perhaps I'll fold in a direct follow-up question um, to you, given your extensive expertise in this area. What is your current assessment of Africa, ICC relations, and what has been called by Kamari Clark a pan-Africanist pushback? First of all, thank you very much uh, to the Nuremberg Academy for inviting me to participate in this uh, book, book launch uh, event. It's a great pleasure to see you, uh, Vivian, and uh, other colleagues uh, on the panel uh, today. I cannot uh, imagine a more timely topic for discussion than this opportunity provided by this book launch, which is to look at the past, the present, and the future of the ICC. So congratulations to you and Alexandra Heinzer uh, for putting together, and the authors actually, a really, really interesting collection. It's a large volume, of, like Leila said that I'm reading through uh, very carefully at the moment, but really, really congratulations to, to all of you uh, for, for the work uh, put in. Uh, on the question itself, um, which is really, in a sense, a two-part question, if you think about the bit about international cooperation, um, I would uh, try to narrow down really to some essential points, about five main points, which in many ways echo uh, some of the points that have already been made. Uh, so the first point is a contextual one, which here of international cooperation, I, I see it as much broader than cooperation in the context of the Rome Statute itself. And I think the responses we've gotten just now uh, reflect that. Uh, when I focus on the Rome Statute, I focus on it for a reason, and that is the core enforcement function and cooperation and uh, limb is critical for the success of the ICC. After all, um, it is the state parties that bear the obligation to cooperate with the court fully um, in achieving the range of uh, investigative, judicial, and prosecutorial functions that the court uh, is entrusted with. So essentially, without the limb of cooperation, as we see, in parts uh, nine and 10 of the Rome statute, the court will not be successful at all. And interestingly, uh, when you think about some of the roles that states are critical in, we've talked about arrests, I think President Omansky mentioned that, and then access to evidence, the trial process, all the way to conclusion and enforcement of sentences or acquittals, allowing individuals to go someplace where they could take up uh, their life after having gone through the, the processes of the court. Yet, when you look at some of those metrics, um, if you think about just example, of arrests by about September 2021, the court had issued 36 arrest warrants. Um, of those, only 20, 20 have been implemented. Uh, three have been withdrawn uh, following the deaths of the suspects and about 12 in total are outstanding. These are suspects that are still at large. Essentially, that's not a finger that's pointing towards the court, it's a finger that's pointing towards the state's parties because where are those individuals? It is the job of the state's parties to transfer those individuals to the court uh, to face uh, the charges that they uh, have been uh, uh, confronted with. Uh, so that's the first point. Second point, um, it's very interesting that when you look at the Rome Statute, in particular part nine, it does rely on the Good Faith Act 
uh, acts of the state's parties themselves. And part of that requires that the states implement the Rome Statute framework in the national legal order. That's the only way you can have the structures in place to ensure that you can cooperate effectively with the court. And I think uh, Christoph uh, Eich uh, talked about the daily job of the court sending requests every day. And when you look around in terms of uh, academic works, there's a study that showed that only about 40%, 40% of the 123 states parties that have enacted implementing legislation. So clearly there's a lot that can be done in terms of uh, there's 60% of the 123 to give effect to the Rome Statute at the national level. Uh, this connects um, to a point that I think already came up and which is perhaps there may be in some instances a need for strengthening co to strengthen cooperation. And I think the example of the IOC draft articles on crimes against humanity uh, completed in 2019 is a great one because it's an opportunity for states to fill a gap in one of the areas in terms of the cooperation that may be necessary at the horizontal level, but also in criminalizing uh, crimes against humanity at the national level. I might just mention in part passing also the effort of the Netherlands, Belgium and Slovenia in terms of the MLA initiative, which could be another aspect of this uh, equation in terms of strengthening the existing regime. And I do not see the two projects as incompatible, I actually see them as compatible with each other. So essentially it would be up to states in terms of what their preferences are in taking those two items forward. Uh, third point, very quickly, is while cooperation and is critical, of course, to support all the range of activities of the court, I think it is also essential, essential when the ASP receives uh, uh, findings of non-cooperation by states parties, that states parties follow through. And that follow through comes from the ASP itself by virtue of the statute. We know that there are a number of other areas where you do not have express obligations under the Rome statute for states, about where other states could actually voluntarily cooperate with the court. And I think it's a point that already came up. So I think that's an important element in terms of the need for both parties to the court, but also non-parties to cooperate with the court even further and dealing, especially for the ASP with the question of non-cooperation. Uh, fourth point, and this is bringing me uh, very close to my, my conclusion, uh, is a broader point, which is to stress that I think the court, and this is a point that connects nicely with all the remarks by all the panelists, the court needs more political and diplomatic cover. Uh, and the court needs to have a goal of universality and that, that goal ought to be taken forward. Ultimately, it will start by keeping the parties that we have already, right? So we've lost two states parties, uh, Burundi and, and Philippines as of October, 2017 and March, 2019 respectively. Uh, that dimension has to be stressed. We need to broaden the, the, the ambit of the court's umbrella in terms of accountability at the global level. And I think states need to step up at the national, bilateral, regional, international levels as Germany and a number of others are doing to provide that pushback when the court comes under attack. Because if the court comes under attack from especially powerful states and there's no response, then that of course op dim diminishes the chances of achieving universality. And it, there's a direct link with cooperation uh, and political attacks. And we saw that if you think about the African region in terms of you know, number of states that were unhappy and therefore taking a decision that they shall not cooperate with the court. So I think the push for universality and the support of regional organizations like the European Union and others uh, is critical. Let me just um, end with a note about the Security Council because I think Christoph provokes me quite a bit uh, by mentioning the role of the Security Council. I think the Security Council clearly has an important role to play in achieving accountability for international crimes at the international level. And we saw that magnificent efforts that gave us the ICTY in 1993 and the Rwanda Tribunal in 1994. Yet when you look at the relationship between the Security Council and the ICC, ICC uh, you look at the IER report that came out, where they said the, there's a basically distinctively less positive view of the Rome Statute among P5 uh, member states. And that's very, very challenging for the court. And it leads directly to, at least in the finding of the expert panel, 15 instances of non-cooperation relating to Sudan and Libya, 15 instances, one five. And part of the argument around this, of course, center on whether there are obligations on the parts of all states to cooperate with the court. So the Security Council, in other words, could do more to support the court using its robust power under Chapter 7, as it has done in other situations, dealing in particular with the Yugoslav and Rwanda situations. And I'll just end on a note that connects this to the point about resources. The Rome statute is very clear that when you have Security Council referrals under Article 115B, you got to pay for them. Okay, the Security Council would make a referral, but it's subject to the funds being provided by the UN. 
Unfortunately, for reasons we all know, there has not been a single dollar sent to the ICC, even though there have been two referrals. I think it's important that that issue is addressed. And I'm glad to see that the prosecutor has raised that issue in his first appearance before the Security Council. It's important. It cannot be stressed enough, both symbolically, but also practically, given that funding is one of the biggest challenges facing the court today. On the ICC Africa issue, because that's a second and different question, I'll just say a couple of quick things. We are in a place now where there is some kind of improved relationship. I would characterize this uh, cautiously as um, we're in a state of a lull, some kind of equilibrium. Uh, but it's also a situation that can be explained by a number of changes, including the fact that there are no high-level government officials that are presently being indicted by the ICC. If you think about the Sudan situation and President al-Bashir and so on, uh, who lost power. And we all know that discussions now with the ISIS with the possibility of cooperation uh, with, with, with the court, even potentially in a transfer. We'll see how that goes. Um, then of course, there's a situation of Kenya, which is no longer uh, before the court because the cases did not uh, mature. And we now have uh, the prosecutor making the decision to hold the whole situation in abe abeyance, at least a former prosecutor. So it'll be interesting to see what happens now. The point that I want to stress as a takeaway on this uh, aspect is to note that in this situation now, where there is that lull, it's an opportunity to engage and try to improve the relationship. So we should not wait for the crisis moment, given the changes that are happening both on the continent and also in the ICC itself in terms of the leadership of the court to actually engage with Africa's substantive concerns. And I see a second point here, which connects to the review process. I think the review process is a great opportunity for African sis to also engage with the ICC system. Unfortunately, the concerns that they've been raising have not featured very much in the, in the report, at least directly. If you think about, for example, the peace justice sequencing question, I haven't seen that in the IER panel. I think that could be a lost opportunity. So I'll just leave it at that. I don't want to go on. I know we have a lot more the points that we want to cover. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here and congratulations again to you, uh, the editors and the authors for this wonderful book. Thanks so much, Charles. And you make powerful five points um, as well as your canvas um, of the current relations going forward. You, you mentioned and were adamant about your fifth point and about the universality. So allow me just a, um, a follow-up question and perhaps to, to later, how do you assess the prospect of universality and the relationship of the court vis-a-vis -vis non states parties? Um, very briefly before we move on to our second topic. Thank you so much. Um, and um, so universality is something that of course the court strives for. And uh, as Charles pointed out, we've lost a couple of parties. We might, we might add Malaysia to that, which sort of came in and, and, and left as quickly as it, as it came in. Um, the one thing I would say is there's a wonderful, very short chapter in the book by um, Judge Tushma Akamadov. I, I, I always don't know if I say that right, but um, uh, the Russian judge at the ICTY and ICTR, who I had the pleasure to meet uh, many years ago. I, I think that sometimes one has to distinguish universality is not going to happen overnight. The, the three P5 members, the United States, China, and Russia are not going to enter immediately. But as his chapter points out, that doesn't mean there's not a lot of interest in the ICC and its work and a lot of opportunities to build bridges with academics in those communities, with uh, there's an ICC moot in Russia, in China, in the United States of America. Um, we fortunately have seen in the United States come in now with a positive statement at the last ICC ASP, a shift of policy with the Biden administration setting out very concrete ways that the United States of America could cooperate with the, um, with the ICC, including, I should add on a personal note, the lifting of the sanctions and the executive order uh, pursuant to which the sanctions could be imposed. And as many of you know, full disclosure, I was involved in litigation against the Trump administration to see the removal of the sanctions and deeply grateful for the Biden administration revoking that executive order. So I think in terms of universality, while we have to strive for universality, especially with large and powerful states, that shouldn't keep us from focusing A, on the smaller states who may be very willing to join the ICC, may, but civil society will be important in those efforts and Melinda can maybe speak to that. Um, and with the larger states, uh, there's a wonderful provocative question in the chat actually, 
could the Nuremberg principles unite the East and West? And I think that is something that has to be striven for, not necessarily at the intergovernmental level, although that would be excellent if it could happen, but in terms of the, could be more epistemic communities that surround the International Criminal Court, its quest for justice, the Nuremberg principles embedded in the core of the, the, the substance of the court, uh, and in, in terms of future development of international law, such as the Crimes Against Humanity Convention, such as the MLA process. So I think I'll just stop there, but I think it's important not to completely fixate on governmental politics and to look deeper um, uh, as we've seen um, in both China and Russia and in the United States and in India, I should add. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Terrific, Lena. Thanks so much. And I think let's look now to the wider institutional landscape um, and the interplay of international and national proceedings. Um, at the opening of the judicial year, um, President Ofmansky, you said what is clear after the ICC's first two decades is that the court has become a permanent feature of the international legal and judicial landscape. And indeed, how do you view the centrality of the ICC in international justice vis-a-vis -vis the wider institutional landscape and the interplay of national and international proceedings? Judge Ofmansky. Uh, th thank you, thank you for this question. Uh, you know, I think the national and international institutions both played a crucial role in the fight against humanity. There is a question, there's basically no question about that. In accordance with the principle of complementarity, the ICC does not have to dominate the field of international criminal justice, but its presence and its permanence are crucial in pushing national jurisdiction um, uh, around the world to address the core crimes. It is how the positive complementarity should work. The ICC is, has certainly both practical and symbolic role in the fight against impunity. The Rome Statute plays a crucial role as a model for countries that have incorporated to the core to, to have incorporated the, the whole core crimes in, the, in the, the, the criminal codes, but also for countries that are going to do so. And the ad hoc tribunals played, of course, an important and pioneering uh, role in, in paving the way for the ICC. But uh, it seems unlikely that, that something similar would be set up. The ICC is, is much more cost cost effective solution. Hybrid courts may continue to play a, a role here and there, particularly if it's a way to, to strengthen domestic capacity by providing some uh, international assistance for domestic um, justice actors. Uh, so I, I think that is, is a place for everybody that we all play play uh, our own roles uh, and we have the common goal and only working together we can achieve it. Thank you very much, President Ofmansky. I think, well, you highlight the, the common goal and I think that's paramount to, to reiterate, absolutely. Um, allow me to, to bring in a child say once more. Um, what do you think, do you think the goal um, or the fight against impunity is better reached by other accountability mechanisms and tribunals, especially in Africa. We, of course, have a proliferation of a variety of different accountability efforts. Um, we have seen into earlier the um, extraordinary African chambers. We have um, the special chamber, um, the efforts um, in Central African Republic um, taking um, off the ground. What's your assessment here about the various fora um, in which the fight against impunity is being pursued today. Thank you again, uh, Vivian, for the uh, question. Um, let me just offer uh, three uh, observations. And I think um, as a starting point, um, I've tended to come to this question about the development of international criminal tribunals, starting with the ad hocs, all the way to the permanent ICC, over time, like many people in the field. And there was that sense, I think, in the early days that once we got a permanent international criminal court, then everything will be fine, right? We do not need to go back and create ad hoc tribunals. 
Uh, unfortunately, the practice is not that, proving that to be the case, right? So the first point is really the point that I think uh, President Hofmansky made earlier, which is that the ICC was not meant to occupy the field of accountability. Uh, when you look at the architect of the Rome Statute itself, while the ICC is central, and I think will remain a cornerstone of that system, the reality, the abject reality is that the ICC was never designed to carry the accountability, responsibility, or burden alone, if you prefer it in terms of a burden. At best, the ICC would give us symbolic prosecutions of individuals bearing greatest responsibility in a given situation. But the entirety of the system, which is what the essence of complementarity is, referred to in the 10th preambula paragraph, of course, the Rome Statute and substantively in Article 17 of the Rome Statute is that the job will be done at the national level. That's the first point, okay? And I think that's very, very important as a point of departure because otherwise we are letting states off the hook. And this goes to a point that uh, Melinda Reed was making earlier, uh, that effectively the court will not be able to fulfill the expectations um, on it. And essentially we let them off the hook if we make the court the court of first and last resort. So that's the first point. So it's a point of departure that the system we have now did not envisage that the ISIS will occupy the field. Second point, and this is a broader observation about international law as a whole. I've been very fascinated by the debates about regionalism in international criminal law for many years. And part of the reason is, uh, when you think about the experimentation that's happening in the African region, when you think about the Malabo Protocol, for example, this idea of an African criminal court that will have jurisdiction over what I call ICC plus jurisdiction over you know, four Rome statute crimes plus 10 other crimes, um, uh, you got a lot of pushback immediate you know, pushing back of, oh, this is not a good idea. You're going to uh, undermine universality and so on. And it got me thinking a lot about the place of regionalism in other areas of international law. If you think about areas such as international peace and security, if you think about international economic law, and fundamentally, given what we're discussing here, if you think about international human rights law, and it turns out, once you start looking at the literature, that we actually had similar debates back in the 50s and 60s about regionalism versus universalism. So in my view, it's time for us to take stock and be very careful in terms of it's sort of reflexively pushing back because the architecture we have does provide and show success for the international community when we've allowed regionalism to work. So for example, if you look at the charter, chapter eight itself, the whole of chapter eight is about regional arrangements, okay? So that's right there, you know, article 52, 53, very prominent in the charter. And we know that the Security Council has worked very well with regional and even sub-regional arrangements. If you think about ECOWAS interventions in Liberia and Sierra Leone, for example, coming back and giving, if you will, legal imprimatur to actions that we're taking at that level. You think about the, the international economic law area and the regional trade agreements on the WTO law. I mean, you have a whole host of countries that are parties to the WTO, 164 at last count, but a whole host of them, almost 90% of them, are involved in some kind of regional trade agreement. And more directly relevant, the international human rights framework. We have all the international mechanisms that we know of, including the Geneva processes, the, of course, the treaty bodies and what have you. But the bottom line is, where would human rights be today in the absence of the European Court of Human Rights, the Inter-American Court and Commission, the African Commission and Court on Human Rights? Sadly, we don't have them as much for Asia yet, so it's not a universal phenomenon. But the point I'm trying to make is, when you look at the lessons from other areas of international law, it seems quite obvious to me that down the line it will be inevitable, given the emerging practice of states, that we will have some element of regionalism in international criminal law. And I think if it's done well, if it's done well, it could be an important component of the wider accountability. Uh, let me just note, uh, note one final point. And you referenced, I think, uh, Vivian, the example of the Habre trial. There might be many instances where the ISIS will not be able to act. There are movements now for accountability in different parts of Africa. If you think about Liberia, if you think about the hybrid court idea for South Sudan and so on, it may be that some specific ad hoc mechanisms could work very well for those particular situations. And obviously this goes into complicated areas, but I do wanna make the point and end on the note that we do have sufficient experience in other areas of international law, whether it's a law of international peace and security, international economic law, international human rights law, that show us that if we keep an open mind that the global architect of accountability need not be binary national or international, there could be intermediate places in between. Spaces for regionalism could be one of them. And we see that begin, beginning of the discussion now apparently happening in Latin America with the effort there to have a drug trafficking court. 
Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Charles. Um, and I think, um, you know, you're right to point out the often discussion in these binary terms, um, and yet you highlight, of course, the starting point, um, the fact that national prosecutions are the starting point if we think also about the principle of complementarity. So allow me briefly to take a look at some of these national prosecutions that are going on. As we know, in Germany and other countries, there are currently many trials against alleged perpetrators of international crimes. The German Code of Crimes, an advanced legal framework with universal jurisdiction enshrined in section one, paved the path for numerous domestic prosecutions and the federal public prosecutor general is playing a vanguard role in that arena. Um, in my view, the role of national prosecutions is a topic we will be further you know, discussing and focusing on, including at the Nuremberg Academy. Indeed, the topic of the international conference in May is precisely, is the future of international criminal law domestic? And we look forward to an engaging discussion, you know, for several panels on that point. But allow me to ask you, Dr. Ike, um, are domestic trials on the basis of universal jurisdiction more promising in fulfilling the goal of ending impunity? Given the proliferation of domestic proceedings and universal jurisdiction cases, how, if at all, will this impact the role and relevance of the ICC today and in the future? Well, as, as, as you have uh, you've pointed out and, and others have pointed out, uh, of course, um, uh, national national trials uh, are um, uh, a, a part of the uh, a part of the whole picture um, uh, and, and, and are not at all uh, diminishing the role of the uh, of the ICC. Um, uh, but but, uh, you know, belong to efforts um, to to combat impunity and to uh, bring perpetrators uh, to justice. Now, as you've pointed out in Germany, we have incorporated uh, provisions of the Rome Statute into our own uh, international criminal code. And, and this combined with the uh, principle of, of universality, which, um, which, which we have in, in Germany has led to a number of, um, uh, of important uh, trials um, where in particular, um, uh, uh, perpetrators from conflicts uh, that um, uh, are not uh, part of the ICC picture, unfortunately, at present, and namely Syria, uh, the crimes of um, uh, of IS, also in in, in Iraq. Um, so, so the, these kind of situations uh, and 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 uh, perpetrators that have been uh, committing crimes in those situations have been brought. Uh, before uh, before courts, uh, and 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 this simply because they were in Germany. Um, that, that's something that uh, you know one one has also to remind, remind ourselves. We we have um, we we've taken in um, many many uh, refugees, in particular from uh, from from Syria, uh, and uh, and and they were they were found uh, by you know by people who recognize them uh, who who are victims, and uh, so it was only logical. Uh, that um, uh, that prosecution would be um, uh, would be uh, started by by the federal prosecutor, uh, but but indeed, uh, Viviane, you have said you've said it very well. It's it's uh, uh, it it is uh, in a way um, uh, groundbreaking because these trials um, are extremely uh, uh, complex and they they need an enormous amount of resources. Uh, uh, witnesses uh, and, and and you you name it. It's an extreme, extremely um, not only costly but but in personnel and resource intensive uh, uh, process that is being that is being undertaken. Um, something that the ICC, of course, does does very does very well um, uh, and and has experience in. Uh, but but um, it's something that uh, you know national jurisdictions. Uh, uh, can can struggle. Um, now we have put a lot of resources. The German government is going to increase the resources for the federal prosecutor uh, to do those uh, those things. Uh, but um, I, I, I would say it's you know, it's 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 important. Um, but uh, but it's a it's a challenge also. Um, but we we will certainly continue on this path and in in the spirit uh, really of of complementarity, um, uh, which 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 is so which is so important. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think indeed many look to 
the German cases and the efforts um, to undertaken in Karlsruhe as, you know, exemplary in terms of the political support um, and the resources provided. And of course, as you mentioned, you know, um, there are ongoing challenges and um, for, for many it is still, you know, too slow, too little. Um, and one can do much more, but I think we have to savor um, these very um, high level achievements um, that we are having um, in, in many countries. Um, and there's international cooperation like the um, German French joint investigative team, for example, as well, it's worth mentioning that cooperation there um, is fundamental for the success of these cases. Um, the role of civil society has been key in the conduct of such proceedings. Um, so Melinda, allow me um, to ask you directly, um, what is your take on the role of national prosecutions? Um, do you see that national prosecutions um, on the basis of universal jurisdiction are more promising and fulfilling the goal of ending impunity? How do you see this vis-a-vis -vis the role and relevance and the permanence, of course, the centrality of the court itself. Perhaps you could um, illuminate some of the perspectives um, from civil society, which I'm sure are uh, manifold. Yes, um, it's a great question. And thank you for the, that last part. Um, trying to represent the views of civil society on any of these complex questions is challenging. Uh, but I think, you know, in, in discussing with our colleagues, what we feel is that universal jurisdiction is, is playing a critical role in addressing uh, the delivery of justice in specific cases. I think particularly in cases where avenues to justice have remained closed, the successes in universal jurisdiction cases can really nourish the norm of accountability. Um, they can add energy, they can add momentum, um, and, and they really, they help to sustain the long-term effort that justice requires. I think that said, you know, we, we do need to invest more. Uh, and I think, you know, what was really potent about the recent verdicts uh, in the Koblenz case in, in Germany is that it was the first trial anywhere for state-sponsored torture in Syria. And the, the, the defendants were not the highest ranking officials, but it sustains a public commitment to the norm of accountability. And that, that really resonated um, for us. I think the, the need to invest is... Um, it's, it's important that we draw lessons from places where there are successes and we need to build practice, not just in Europe, but also in the Americas, in, in Africa, et cetera. Because if we are not investing more, we, we are not addressing the fact that there are gaps that still remain. There are legislative framework gaps, particularly in the US, um, and there's some positive signs there. But I think one of the issues that, that really resonated um, uh, among our members is that because these processes take place in national courts that may be unfamiliar with the importance of outreach to affected communities, a discourse that we do find in the international courts and tribunals, even if, if not perfectly realized, uh, there really needs to be particular capacity building for national authorities on what it takes to render justice for victims that is visible to victims. They may not speak the language of the proceedings and in the absence of outreach efforts, they, they may really not they may not experience the, the justice in the same way they do when there's a concerted effort around outreach. Um, I think, you know, the nature of your universal jurisdiction means that it will rarely be able to address accountability comprehensively, at least not in the same way that international courts and tribunals can. Um, and I think that it is, it, it's important to sort of underscore that the relevance of territorial courts in the ICC will remain and the hard work of supporting those comprehensive efforts, um, it, particularly against political backdrops that may not be supportive, will remain. But what we can and should do is really work to do a better job of joining together in the narratives of the role of universal jurisdiction, that of the ICC, and that of national courts exercising territorial jurisdictions, and bring all of those narratives together comprehensively into what the fight against impunity can and should look like. Thanks. Thank you very much, Melinda, um, for, yes, hammering home some of the points that are important from your perspective. And of course, you're very much attuned to the live experiences um, of many on the ground. Um, so I think that was very, very valuable um, that you mentioned, I think, a very important point made about outreach. Um, also, I think we could, you know, spend so much time on this very important topic, um, perhaps considering the increase in national investigations and proceedings concerning core international crimes, 
um, the question sometimes is raised, should there be a cooperation framework between national prosecutors, alternative investigation mechanisms and private investigators? How could such a cooperation um, be assessed under part nine of the Rome Statute, for example? Um, and here I'd like to, to bring you back in, um, Alex, to, to share some of your views with us. Well, yeah, thank you, Viviane. And um, I'm only representing all those who do um, a lot of research uh, on open source evidence and private investigations, which is also um, a huge chapter chapter in the book. Um, so um, the direct effects um, of the lack of resources, uh, Josh Hofmansky mentioned, and, and many of the other panelists, uh, does not only affect, obviously, the mission um, of the court, but also um, the, the rights of the defense. Uh, and uh, we obviously need other sources of evidence. Um, so um, I believe the question is not so much who cooperates with whom, but but the evidence uh, itself. And take the international criminal trials in Germany, the, the latest Koblenz trial, a large portion of the evidence was taken from a context where it wasn't the state or th authorities who collected the evidence. Uh, the court uh, or the prosecution cooperated with, uh, with CJA, how do we know this? We know this because civil society representatives were in the in the trial and took notes. Uh, and the trial monitoring is something which is incredibly important um, uh, in these trial. And as Dr. Ike mentioned, this this costs this is costly, and this is also a lot of effort for for the presiding judge. So the picture is this: we have an omnipresence um, of the collection of evidence um, of the alleged commission uh, of international crimes. Um, and sometimes are very often unrelated to an investigation or even a preliminary examination. And then at the UN fact-finding missions, commissions of inquiry, commissions on, on human rights and independent in, 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 investigative um, mechanisms. So um, this is all laudable. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong, but I, I think this is a huge challenge both for the court, but also for national, national jurisdictions. We need a uniform ethical uniform ethical standards and body of, of, of evidence law somehow that can cope uh, with, with this situation. Um, and um, to be very clear, a lack of resources um, on the part of the ICC um, has an impact um, on, on national jurisdictions. Uh, and as Melinda Reed said, um, there, is, there is not much awareness uh, of outreach, even though in the Koblenz trial, I think um, the people involved tried their best you know, to, to, to make sure um, that, um, for example, press releases are translated uh, and so on. So um, to make sure in the future we need to adapt to, to this situation, it needs to be clear how evidence was obtained by, by whom and why. Um, I remember during a conference last year, I heard someone from a triple IM uh, fantasizing about a large pool, world pool of evidence for core crimes. Uh, and I do see the advantage of, of having this large fridge where a prosecutor can just take out whatever he or she wants uh, to prove a case, but, but there are certainly dangers. Uh, and it is a Herculean task for a judge of Mansky, uh, judge of Mansky certainly knows this, um, to adapt to this situation and still uh, keep the duration of the trial to, to a minimum. This is about technical stuff. This is about software and so on. Um, so for this scenario, we need transparency rules and especially effective remedies, uh, both on the international and national level. Thanks very much um, for, for sharing those views. And, and perhaps, Leila, if I may bring you in, what's your assessment in terms of the, the need for cooperation um, in this arena and the prospects for future cooperation in, in this arena? So if I can, and thank you so much, Viviana, uh, for, for the question, if I can put my law professor hat on just for a moment, I, I think um, one of the the core problems with um, the international criminal justice system, right, with the system as a whole, is that while we have relatively good, relatively good, we still have some contestation about the substantive law, that is, what is a crime against humanity, what is a war crime, etc. The Nuremberg principles hold pretty well on that, although we're even feeling a little pushback on some of that. Um, we get a lot of contestation on which courts should have jurisdiction or what methods should we use to actually 
um, uh, apply the law. And even in the ICC statute, we're seeing lots of motions now on jurisdiction. We're having uh, case law on this, which I think is very important. Um, my own country continues to contest the, the core norm that a state has jurisdiction over its territory, over even non-nationals, and therefore the ICC does as well. And when we come to enforcement, when we come to part nine, or when we come to interstate cooperation, we see that the jurisdiction, that, that this axis of international criminal law is the weakest. And so so ironically, we have a lot of bold proclamations about what is a what is a crime and that individuals are responsible for these crimes. And then when it comes to enforcement, we see that it's much, much trickier. And so I think we need to build that muscle. I think responding to a little bit of what I see in the chat, one of the reasons that um, the ICC was initially more successful in looking at intrastate crimes um, between, say, rebel groups, which happened to be in Africa, I don't, I don't disagree with that, was because you didn't have states uh, shutting down those investigations quite so quickly. Once states have the ability to decide whether to pull in or to pull out in Philippines, in Burundi, in other situations, you're going to have a lot more obstacles to the procedural activity that needs to happen, the actual arrest of suspects, and the actual churning over of evidence. And so there's probably nothing more important to the success of the International Criminal Justice Project as a system than to build robust uh, procedural mechanisms for cooperation. I think it's quite difficult, actually. This is where states will push back the most. The ICTY was very lucky when it finally got cooperation from the United States that it actually got intelligence information from the United States. And so they could actually see where were the mass grave sites, where was the fresh dirt actually over over a killing field. And um, the ICC in part nine has this exception for our national security information, which I think the US delegation was very proud of having negotiated. But when you're looking for evidence of mass atrocities, uh, we need that kind of national, uh, that kind of intelligence that can show us that. So to me, this is where the most, uh, it sounds like the most technical and less interesting part of, of the Rome statute and national systems. But in fact, unless we can get arrest warrants implemented and unless we can do evidence collecting in a way that produces, as Alexander has said, usable evidence that can withstand being tested by defense lawyers and very appropriate ways um, in, in a criminal trial, I think it's going to be quite difficult. That's why I agree with Charles that the MLA treaty has some real positive aspects of it, um, because it would provide even more uh, interstate cooperation. The Crimes Against Humanity initiative that I've been directing for so long also has very, very robust interstate cooperation procedures. And if I can just add one more note, you know, the way I try to teach this is to take international criminal law in the core crimes area and look at the transnational crime area where we have much better tools actually for uh, in the corruption treaty in the organized crime convention in all of those treaties states have committed themselves already to very robust frameworks for cooperation and I think we need to get them to set aside their hesitations and agree to very similar cooperation frameworks for core crimes and that that will help very much uh, both the ICC and at the national level. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leila. And of course, it's a topic we could you know, discuss at much more length. Um, I think I'd like to thank all the audience members already for posting some of the questions. Um, of course, keep in mind, due to the large number of participants and limited time, we're not able to answer all of the questions. Um, but I will fold in the live questions um, as we keep going along. So turning to impact outlook and what has often already been mentioned, the independent expert review report. Um, reviewing institutional practice can be painstaking process, but of course it's essential to build enduring institutions. So in terms of continuity and renewal, we all know that the report um, was published um, more than a year ago now, coming up to one and a half years. And in light of the debates on the international expert review and the recommendations set out, um, President Ofmatsky, allow me to start with you. What do you see as the most important change you would like to see at the court? In your view, what is the required 
or requirements to strengthen the court as it embarks onto its third decade. And I'll immediately follow up because we had a question that was directly related to with what you opened, namely that these um, the review report um, are being taken seriously. And you mentioned implementation um, and an audience member is curious if you could elaborate what the status of implementation is. Thank you. Yes, th thank you for this question. Yes, I think that the court has already, already, already learned much and improved in many ways during the first two uh, decades. And we continue to do that all the time. Take, for example, what the judges have done to, to expedite proceedings. In the last few years, we have self-imposed time limits for the issuance of, of judgments. We have adopted models for drafting and structure of judgment. We have significantly shortened the transition from the pretrial to trial stage and so forth and so on. All these agreements are important steps to the, to, to, that, that help just to reduce the length of the proceedings, which is, of course, always a challenge in international criminal justice. So the philosophy continuous improvements is already there. But of course, we can do more. We can do more. We, we use and we will use the independent expert review to the extent that it is its recommendations prove useful from the point of, of from this point of view. We do not agree with all of them, but but it was never the point. The idea was to put recommendations on the table, then assess them carefully to choose the ones that, that can can be useful implemented either as such or with modifications. And this is a complex exercise. Uh, that requires cooperation of org or organs of the court and, and also the, the assembly of state parties. I have to say that, that the review process uh, has put quite a strain on the court because we are doing uh, it on the top of, of, of all regular work, which, which happens to be now at the most intensive level we have uh, ever seen. And many of the IA recommendations concern issues that are entirely complex and sensitive. So they cannot be simply resolved overnight, or otherwise we may end up with something that could weaken the court instead of strengthening it. Looking uh, uh, to the future, what I hope the most is that state remains serious about their commitment to the ICC as an independent and effective criminal justice institution. That means providing sufficient resources for the ICC to cope with its uh, work workload, uh, but it would be devastating for the victims and other stakeholders that the court can take on uh, the new investigation in a name only. States must also cooperate with the ICC even when it might be inconvenient. Cooperation cannot be about picking and choosing. And finally, states must truly uphold the ICC's independence. That means, among other things, respecting the fact the ICC is simply different from, from most other international organizations because states are not in charge. States are actually not part of the organization like they are and for, for instance, OPCV or OSCE, to give just some examples. The ICC is not a secretariat. It is an independent institution. And the ISP is, is, is the multilateral state-driven arm of the Rome status system. And both ASP and the court work towards the same goals. But the separation must never, uh, uh, nevertheless be, be respected. Otherwise, the danger is that, that the ICC will no longer be a, a real judicial um, institution. I will stop with that and back to you. Back to Thank three. you very much, President Ofmansky. Um, same question, Dr. Ike. allow me to ask you what you make of the independent expert review. What do you see as the most important change that you would like to see? And how do you see the prospects in terms of strengthening the court as it embarks onto its third de decade? 
Uh, well, th th thank you very much. I, I, I will perhaps not say too much about, uh, you know, the changes I would like to see, because um, as Professor, uh, as President Hofmanski has, has pointed out, I, I, I think, you know, most recommendations uh, are directed to the organs uh, uh, of, of, uh, of the ICC, of the court, its prosecutor, the registry, the judges, and so on. And what is important, uh, and, and, and I, I think there, is, there, there can be no doubt about this, that the recommendations are being taken seriously, and that, that work is being done on, on the many recommendations that have been made. I, I think, I think um, uh, but what I would say is that um, um, the, the, the independent uh, review was extremely important um, uh, at the time um, uh, when, when it was, 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 was uh, completed. Um, uh, you know, it's the, the ICC, we're talking about the ICC 20 years, that's still a young institution. And, and it, it was uh, extremely important that, you know, there, there is this exercise uh, of, of uh, you know, um, uh, of, of reflection, review, you know, what can it be do better, where are the challenges, where can we go from here, um, uh, and, and, and this in, in a, in a, in a, at a time when uh, the court was facing also many challenges, uh, and 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 there were there were you know some questions being put on efficiency and 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 uh, you know what has it actually achieved? Um, you know on, only very few people have been convicted. Uh, you know many acquittals and 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 um, uh, and court cases that have been thrown out and so on. So it, it was important to have this independent independent review. Um, and and the, the 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 I mean it's a it's a when you look at the uh, the report and recommendations and talk to people that have been working on this report, um, you know they have they have found a, a, a lot of a lot of things and as uh, uh, President of Manske has said they are also very useful things and I'm sure that they will be uh, taken uh, taken into account and we as state parties in the ASP of course uh, monitoring this very very quickly we have also said that we see a role for us state parties uh, in in the ASP uh, working together with uh, with the organs of the court um, to to actually uh, have a you know a good a good outcome on 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 this review process thanks thank you very much Melinda um, allow me to to bring Again, the perspective of um, civil society in here, very, very important. The report has sparked a flurry of activity, of advocacy, um, of veritable you know, reform agenda, if you like. Um, could you perhaps speak to your view um, in terms of what you would like to see, um, how this process continues, how the review is being received, digested and, and implemented and addressed? Over to you, Melinda. Thank you. Uh, this, this was a really uh, great question for us. Civil society, as you rightly indicated, has been quite involved in this process. Uh, we have a team within the coalition focused on this work, um, and it's, it's been a very um, meaningful and tangible opportunity to engage on, on some of these themes. So I think, you know, the, the ICC, in, in order to be strengthened, what we need is increased ownership across all states' parties in partnership with civil society. And I think the more importantly, the orientation of the court needs to move towards affected communities. I think victims, survivors, and broader communities affected by crimes within its mandate are the court's first constituencies. Um, I think this is not to the exclusion of the stakes the entire global community has in the success of the court, but I think first and foremost, the court has to deliver meaningful justice to victims and survivors. I think, you know, realistically, it's important to note that the court will never meet all the expectations of, of the global community as it delivers justice, but it should look for every opportunity it can to ensure justice delivered in the courtrooms will resonate and respond to the experiences of the victims it serves. And I think this requires a, a you know, sort of a range of international efforts to seek to view its work from the perspective of affected communities and adapt what it does to the impact the court is having or not having in those communities. And I think the IER process offers real potential here. Um, I think the IER makes a number of very specific recommendations that could help root the court's work more deeply in the affected communities. And I think that's, that's my statements here are not to take um, a specific view on these recommendations, but more to suggest that their assessment could spark the kind of discussion needed to increasingly orient the court's work towards effective communities. 
Um, I'll just there. There's so many I could I could highlight here, but I'll just list a couple. Um, I think some of the recommendations that would really help root the court's work more meaningfully in affected communities are uh, recommendation 148, taking step to measure the court's impact as part of its performance indicators. Um, I think uh, recommendations 154 through 159 talk about the court and how it relates to civil society organizations, including particularly those located in situations under investigation. Um, R205 talks about increased use of judicial site visits and in situ proceedings. Um, I, again, I could go on and on, I will not, but I think there are some really great opportunities here. Um, and beyond these specific aspects of the court's work, you see across the IER a push to the court's organs to be more strategic. Um, for example, in recommendations to the OTP to develop situation specific strategies to guide its work, and then moving on from preliminary examination to investigation to completion. And I think those recommendations are really helpful as well. Um, but you know, in the interest of time, I, I will sort of start to wrap up here. Strategies alone do not guarantee a more victim-oriented outcome. The point is that if these strategies are developed, it provides an inflection point to ask about and prioritize increasing the court's impact with victims and affected communities and instituting change processes as needed in court policy and practice to arrive at that end. And I think, again, there's so many opportunities here to have the court really look, look at where its focus is and to orient itself towards those impacted communities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melinda, for canvassing once again the flurry of um, activities and focal points um, that you're looking into and, of course, um, our panel discussion cannot do justice in detail to, to many of these. So thanks for sharing um, you know, a synopsis of what is actually being worked on on the ground. Um, Charles, same question to you. Allow me to bring you back in. Um, what do you make of the independent expert review process and where we stand at the moment? What would you like to see being taken forward um, in terms of the court? And allow me to address um, two questions which are on the UN Security Council to you from, from the audience members. And I know you had a passionate uh, plea regarding the Security Council earlier on in our discussion. So um, one question is how we can get the Security Council to fulfill its duties under the UN Charter in combination with the Rome Statute. And similar to that is the question more provocatively, um, why is the ICC and the international community being um, you know, taken hostages um, by the UN Security Council? Um, and I'll leave it um, for you to, to take up that particular point of the role of the Security Council in the wider politics on the ICC. Thank you so much again, uh, Vivian. Um, those are, of course, uh, very difficult questions. Uh, so let me just share very briefly um, some reflections on starting with the uh, IER process. And in a way, uh, my interest in the IER really connects very nicely to all the previous speakers and their views that this was a great opportunity for the court. Um, I should perhaps just add, as we all know, that this is this was not unique. We saw similar processes of external review uh, with the special court for Sierra Leone done by the Jade, uh, late judge Antonio Cassesi. We saw that in respect of the ICTY and the ICTR as well. So all of these institutions that preceded the ICC benefited from having some kind of external you know, status check, let's check your pulse and see what we could work on if you're still alive and I would strengthen you, right? So I think it's a credit, and this is not stressed enough, it's a credit to the principles of the court that they are the ones who requested the external review. I think that's very, very important um, to underline. Second point, I agree completely uh, with uh, Christoph and of course uh, other colleagues that this is now in the hands of the organs of the court to engage uh, with, with the, with the the recommendations and see what they think is workable and very importantly consistent with the Rome Statute. For me, that's important. And the independence of the court is critical in that regard. I mean, I cannot stress enough. I mean, we all know what the big fight was to get an independent prosecutor. So nothing can be done through the back door that cannot be done through the front door. And for me, the front door is the Rome Statute. It will be the guiding light for all of the work that needs to be done now. And whatever reforms happen should happen in that context, that the Rome Statute is unassailable. We're not going to do anything to finagle with it and, and get to outcomes that may be outcomes that we were not able to get negotiated 20 years ago, okay? Third point, that's an opportunity that I think we have to be very cautious that we do not get lost because 
uh, it, it's one thing to focus on the role of the organs of the court and what they cannot do. And I can understand the impulse of states. I mean, they're spending a lot of resources and political capital in supporting the court, uh, some more than others. But the point is, there is another side to the story, and that is what is the role of the Assembly of States parties? What are the responsibilities of the individual member states of the Rome Statute system? We talked about examples of cooperation agreements, implementing legislation. We talked about a lot of different things, some of which are not new, actually. We've been dealing with these questions for the past 20 years. So for me, to some extent, what we have to avoid is to forget that there was a part of the review process that was meant to be state-driven. So if you look at the resolution that set up the independent expert review, essentially there was an envisage to be a set of key questions that will be addressed by the independent expert panel. So the governors, the judiciary in the investigations and prosecutions, but also states parties were supposed to engage directly through their own working groups on the question of strengthening cooperation, dealing with the question of non-cooperation, the question of complementarity and this business about negative or positive complementarity that has come up before and improving uh, the relationship in terms of the court and national criminal jurisdiction and seeing what can be done at that level. And then of course, there's that issue of uh, equitable and geographical representation and gender balance in the work of the court. So that bit of it is quite important in my mind. And I should note that one of my own uh, cautious uh, critiques of the IR process was there have been some significant concerns about the ICC from state parties in the African region that have had a lot of experience with the court. Luckily, now we all agree that there are some problems because it used to be that when African states would raise these issues, there wasn't the political support. We've gotten past that point. But what we ought to be very careful about is not to lose this opportunity to engage with those states to address the issues as we are going forward with the establishment of a permanent review mechanism and what have you. And I would say that for me, it was quite a surprise that out of the 384 recommendations, there was none centrally picking up one of the biggest complaints of the African region, which is the peace justice question. And that's a question that obviously has broader, that would have broader relevance, not just to Africa, if you think about debates we have in now about Colombia, we've had those debates for many years. So the sequencing of peace and justice will be a global question for the ICC, no matter where it works. So let me just leave it at that to say, we shouldn't lose that opportunity on that element. And then on the, the role of the Security Council, I think this is a good segue for me to make a couple of observations. I think the Security Council has been, again, a leader in this area in terms of developing international justice. There's no doubt about that. That's how we got chapter seven tribunals and we opened up the idea of international criminal law. Having said that, it is quite disturbing. And I think Leila's point is well taken that we can't expect some of the members of the Security Council to join. That's fine, but you can take measures to support the court and recognize the link between your efforts to maintain international peace and security with the work of the court. After all, by the very chapter seven decisions that the council itself has taken in the past, by having article 13B for referral powers, article 16 for deferral powers, we've now embedded in the system a role for the security council. But with that role comes the responsibility for the council to exercise its mandate in a manner that is compatible and supportive of the Rome statute system. It cannot be that you send referrals to the ICC, you do not pay for them. It cannot be the case that you impose obligations only on the referred state, so Libya, Sudan, firstly, and then Libya, without imposing the same obligation on everybody else. Otherwise, we'll get back to the problem of, okay, well, is there now a possibility that the court could request a head of state to be transferred to the court? And the whole al-Bashir saga that ended up in the appeals chamber, we know where that ruling came and all the pushback that it got too. But the point I'm making is maybe some of those issues could have been avoided if the council stepped up. In terms of the element of what can be done practically, I think there are some states, for example, France, Mexico, and others that are pushing this idea that you do not exercise a veto in relation to atrocity crimes. I think that's a good first step. It doesn't solve the problem. We have to be very clear about that, but it is an effort in that direction. Luckily, a number of the P5 have kind of joined on board on that issue. I'm not sure that we get all five of them, but the point is that progress is incremental. But the key is that the Security Council can enable the role of the ICC and it can already step up a little bit more than it's doing now. And it's nice to see that there's a change of wind in, Was in Washington that could be supported towards the court. Let me leave it at that. Uh, Jeffrey asked a very nice question about I ICC Africa relationships, but of course um, we're running out of time. So maybe I'll put something in the chat for him. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Charles. Thank you so much. And of course, you know, we are coming to the end of this discussion. Um, I do want to point out um, two questions that deserve uh, more attention and I'll invite now for very brief final reflections all speakers once again. Um, 
One is what is the role of international criminal law scholarship and um, what is the impact on decisions at the ICC? Um, and also one is about precisely the role of civil society in setting up these other tribunals that we have, such as the Russell Tribunal, the Ugar Tribunal, um, and perhaps that's a question that Melinda would like to take up. Um, so for final reflections, it is my great pleasure to invite our speakers once again for very, very brief um, discussions. And that is precisely, um, I will start with President Ofmansky, if you would like to share some final reflections from your point of view. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Madam Presiding. Uh, it was uh, firstly I would like to say that it's a great pleasure to 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 be present during this this meeting. Uh, I, I would like to thank for inviting me for, for for discussion. It is always a great pleasure to to meet to exchange out with, with with scholars. As my own background is not only ju judicial but also academic, I have been a judge for almost 30 years, but I was also a professor of law for more than 20 years before I joined the ICC. Uh, I would also uh, once again uh, congratulate the Nuremberg Academy of the, for, for the publication of the, of the anthology, anthology. As I indicated in my foreword, uh, high quality academic literature plays a key role in popularizing the idea of international criminal justice. And thank you, thank you once more uh, again. Thank you very much, President Ofmansky. Thank you so much for your warm words. Um, thank you. Um, I'd like to invite um, Dr. Ike for final reflections. Yes, th thank you very much. And, and, and briefly, um, really just to say that this has been an extremely rich discussion and I'm very grateful uh, for having been invited to participate in it, and I, I, I think we've 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 gone a uh, we've come a long way in in, in twenty years. Uh, I remember I was also working uh, in the, in the legal in the legal department when we, uh, you know, when we uh, when we were in Rome, and 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 I was working with later Judge Hans Peter Kaul uh, on on the Rome on the Rome Statute, uh, and and I, I think really uh, this is tremendous what we have uh, achieved. I'm not sure uh, we would have been able to achieve it uh, today 20 years later so it's important that we did it then and uh, uh, you know and continue on the on the path we are sure we're in for 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 the long haul i i think that's that's the expression one can use um but but let's let's continue uh, to work together uh, you know civil society states the organs um professors uh, and and so on and the nuremberg academy of course but thank you very much thank you very much dr ike um now turn to, to leila Thank you so much. And I'll also keep my remarks very brief because this has been a very full morning. Um, paragraph 20 of the independent expert report notes that the report's job was not to focus on the successes of the ICC. And likewise, it's very rare that you hear an academic uh, title of a new article or blog post that says why the ICC's judgment in X was fantastic and got it right. Um, typically, we write reports and academics write articles uh, as critics, as explainers, as dissectors of, of what we're studying. And it's perhaps a professional deformation <laughs> that we do that. And I think it is important to um, acknowledge successes wherein there are successes. Uh, that wasn't the job of the independent expert report and many academics don't see it as their job. I'm sometimes accused of, of being too Pollyanna-like in my work on the ICC, but I've had my day of, of criticism as well. I think what I would say is um, as much as I think it, it's important for the academy to be fair and also to propose solutions, um, I think one of the great things that could come out of your book, actually, Viviana and Alexander, is there's so many recommendations at the ends of chapters. If you pulled them out into a document, I think it could be a very, very helpful uh, contribution going forward. Because if Kip, Hale, Kip Hale's chapter is just an example of how you could add um, United Nations Security Council sanctions committee um, could have a prosecutor ICC arrest part of it. Um, 
I think the other thing I would love to emphasize is the important work that the court's uh, judges are doing. And when I teach in my university, one of the things I teach is cases and students read the actual decisions. So um, President Hofmansky, I think uh, one shouldn't underestimate how um, a beautiful turn of phrase or a, a ringing judgment that um, supports the victims, that is uh, careful, that is coherent, can resonate. It's one of the court's most important legacies, actually, is all the judgments that are being penned by you and your colleagues, which are going to be dissected and studied and taught and excerpted for the newspapers. So I think um, I've, I've addressed a, a few of the different questions there, uh, Viviana, and I think I'll just thank you again for the opportunity to be part of this really extraordinary book launch. Terrific. Thanks very much, Leila. Um, over to Melinda to share some final reflection, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, and thank you so much for the opportunity to be a part of this. It's, it's been fascinating to hear my fellow panelists and, and the presentation of the book. Um, and we just we would love to take a moment again just to highlight the amazing partnership between civil society and states parties and the court. Um, you know, we, we look back at the, the partnership and how that allowed for early entry into force. Um, and we just wanted to, to state as, as a group that the civil society, as always, we we stand ready to continue to highlight the successes of the court and to face the challenges, um, and that we are looking forward to another discussion shortly at the 25th year or, or whenever that happens to reflect further on, on the incredible achievements of the court. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melinda. Um, now over to, to Charles. Thank you so much um, for the opportunity to be here and to be part of this fascinating uh, conversation with fellow panelists. Um, we've heard a lot of things uh, said on this panel, and I would have to say that I agree with a lot of what has been said, uh, especially this idea that 20 years is a long time, but it's also not a long time. Uh, when you said the ICC in the context of the march from 1945, uh, the Nuremberg moment, the famous Nuremberg moment that gave us Nuremberg principles and this idea of an international criminal tribunal that could not be successfully done for in the genocide convention. Here we are now, we have a court. So I think that achievement in a historical perspective makes 20 years, actually only a few years, if that. And one would have to say that it is a singular achievement of the international community. So today, it may be the case that multilateralism and international cooperation are under attack. Quite strangely, at a time where with the pandemic and other things, we see that, in fact, Without multilateralism and international cooperation, you could not have the stability in international law and international affairs that we have today. So just to say that we're going to keep the faith, those of us who are committed to the idea of international law and justice. And I think it's in many ways it's true, as Leila was saying, that uh, the successes are often underplayed. But this is a year of reflection. Well, we'll be having a lot of uh, 20th anniversary events, and this is a great first event. So congratulations to all of you. I look forward to working with the Nuremberg Academy and ISIL as part of the series to see what we can do collectively to turn the spotlight on some of those issues, you know, sometimes bringing in regional perspectives to emphasize the inclusivity of the global justice project that the ICC represents. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. And it's great to see you all, uh, co-panelists, and of course, congratulations to the authors, some of whom didn't put the cameras. I'm sure they were listening. So well done. Thanks very much, Charles. And then um, last final reflection also from, from Alex, over to you. Thank you, Viviana. Thank you for hosting this. And again, thank you to the panelists and contributors to the book. Um, just very shortly, um, <clears throat> I mean, there are so many matters that are not so popular as state cooperation and so on. And uh, Leila Sadat mentioned this evidence law. Uh, in, the, in the expert review, there, there was a large section on recruitment, training, judicial quality, staff members. These are all things that are so incredibly important. And I feel that we do have an, an epistemic community of international criminal lawyers, um, which can be an advantage and disadvantage. Um, you know, you need to recruit from this pool people from other institutions, uh, people who know what they are doing. But at the same time, you need to get, get fresh um, fresh motivation and, and of course, um, also fresh ideas. And I, I think this also applies to, to scholarship. And I, I, to be fair, sometimes scholarship didn't do a good job in the, in the last years. Uh, and um, this also applies to it, um, the quality and, 
Um, I feel that uh, scholarship is changing um, through social media and, and, and other, other methodology aspects. And we have to ask ourselves whether, whether some decisions really need to, me need to be commented on five minutes after publication uh, on Twitter, you know. Um, so um, there's someone who said, we have now this scholar as advocate or public intellectual. Um, so, and I think we need to be, we need to be critical about this and, and maybe look deeper into, into matters that, that are complex. And sometimes the, the second thought is probably more important than the first one. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I wanted to contribute. Thank you very much. Thank you all for sharing these valuable final reflections. That concludes our event today. Thank you for bearing with us. What a terrific panel it has been. Once again, special thanks to all authors of the book and to all distinguished experts who continuously um, allow us a fuller appreciation and appraisal of the court itself. The discussion today, I think, has shown once again the importance of this continuous task, revisiting the past, examining the present and imagining the future. Thank you to everyone who has been with us, who has been watching, and of course, once again, to our terrific expert speakers. It has been a great conversation. Thank you.